Harvard, and he's going to be talking about uh, peeling arguments and uh, Bloom lookup tables. Uh, so I was told that since I'm the last talk of the day, I can pretty much go as long as I want. So we're going to have like a Ted Cruz type event uh, going on here for, for you. Um, no, I'll try to, try to be more or less on time. Um, so uh, this talk was going to be sort of meant for a, a broad audience. So uh, for those of you who know all this stuff, I'm gonna, just going to apologize in advance. But I'm going to do sort of a survey of, of peeling arguments and where they come from and some of the places they arise. Then I'll talk about you know, some of my own work. And then I'll have a few slides at the end that at least provide some you know, details of what some of the new stuff is, even if I'm not going to present the full arguments. Okay, so um, let's start with one of the very basic peeling arguments. So we have a graph, and we'd like to find a matching. Um, usually, this is in the context of a random graph. Um, and so what can you do? Well, you can use the following sort of peeling approach. I'm going to find a vertex of degree 1. Okay, so there's just one edge out of it. So I might as well throw it into the matching with you know, the other vertex on the other edge and repeat. And you can prove pretty easily uh, that this is sort of an optimal strategy in the sense that you know, as long as you do this, there, there's a maximal matching where those edges are involved in the matching. Okay? And so you can just repeat this process until you're out of vertices of degree one, and then you quit. Right? So uh, just we're all on the same page. right? There's an edge of degree one. So I'm going to throw it in the matching, and I'm going to peel it away. And once I peel away those two vertices, Right, that, that's in the matching, all the remake corresponding edges, right, all the other adjacent edges adjacent to the other vertex are also going to disappear. Right? And what that means is that you can see is that even though I only started here with one vertex of degree one, because I'm sort of removing edges as I peel things, lo and behold, another vertex of degree one is now freed up, so I can continue peeling and so on, and I can sort of match everything. Okay? So that's how peeling sort of works. Um, and this algorithm for matching in a random graph uh, was studied by a couple of known names, Karps and Sipser, way back when. Um, and they showed that there's a threshold behavior. And this is sort of very common when you look at peeling arguments in the setting of random graphs, that you get a sort of threshold behavior where things ha below the threshold happen one way with high probability, and above the threshold happen another way with high probability. And the threshold behavior was that they showed that if the number of edges is sufficiently small, you know, if you have a sparse enough graph, if it's less than en over 2, then this process will continue until it's left with a vanishingly small number of edges. Right? So by doing this process, you're getting, up to lower order terms, the maximum matching. Um, and I should point out that above the threshold, in fact, you know, sort of the opposite happens, that you get some sort of linear size clump left over of, of edges. Okay? Um, and they used an analysis based on, of all things, differential equations. And I'm not going to try and put up differential equations, although maybe this audience is more familiar, more applied math type people in this audience might actually like differential equations. Um, but differential equations is sort of a way of uh, analyzing the limiting performance of these types of systems. Okay. Let's look at another example, uh, a bit more complicated, a satisfiability peeling argument. Um, so here we're talking about random k sat, right? Here's an example of three sat, right? So each clause has three variables in it. We choose them and their sign, whether they're negated or not, randomly. Um, and that's how we get a random k sat formula. And we can look at uh, the ratio of the number of clauses to the number of variables. Right? I can have n variables, and I can consider how many clauses I have. And of course, the, the k, again, in this example, is 3, is how many literals per clause. Okay. And so there's something called the pure literal rule. Okay? And the pure literal is while you have a pure literal, that is, um, you know, while you have uh, a literal that appears only positively or only negatively, Right, so that's why it says it appears zero times. Maybe it appears zero times positively or zero times negatively. Okay. Um, so while you have a literal that appears zero times, um, you can set its uh, value to zero and its negation to one. Right? It's only appearing one way in the clause. Set it the way that you know, it's true in all the clauses that it's in. Okay? And once that's done, we can, again, peel away that variable, peel away all the clauses that it's involved in, because those are now satisfied, and continue. Okay. 
Um, you can view this as, uh, again, you can stick it in a random graph interpretation by viewing it as a bipartite graph with vertices being literals on one side and clauses on the other. Um, and the point is, is that when you get to something that sort of has a, a degree zero, right, you can think of these uh, literals as being in positive negative pairs, and when one of them drops to zero, you get to remove them in the neighboring clauses. So it's a slightly more complicated way of graph that you might be thinking of. You've got pairs of things to worry about instead of individual things and so on. You've got counts. Um, but you can still put it into this sort of random graph framework. Okay, and this was uh, first studied by Broderfries and Upfall in 1996. Um, and then I like look at the Carp Sipser paper, sort of figured out you could also put it in differential equation form to get sort of these constants in, in tight form. And again, you have this sort of threshold behavior that when the ratio of the number of clauses to the number of variables is below some constant, then the pure literal world, uh, pure literal uh, algorithm will find a solution with high probability, and above it won't. Above it will get to some sort of clumping step. Okay. All right, so one of the hopes of this talk is to sort of convince you that this is not just sort of a random accident. This is actually like an algorithmic paradigm, right? So much as we have uh, dynamic programming and greedy algorithms and divide and conquer, I like to think of be, have people be aware of or, or think of the peeling paradigm in terms of algorithms. It's really, I guess, a subclass of greedy style algorithms, right? It's a greedy approach, um, but it's one that comes up enough that I think it should have, you know, its own, you know, mental framework and way of people thinking about it. Um, and again, the general approach of this is you find a node of degree one, remove all the edges and the other adjacent node, and continue. But as we've seen already, there are sort of variations on the theme. One of the most common variations is that you might not really need the node to have degree one. You might be okay is that uh, as long as its degree is at most some number, right? And so uh, combinatorialists or graph theorists will know this is called the k-core. It's the maximal subgraph with all the degrees of the vertices being at least k, the k-core is unique, and you can find the k-core by peeling. Right? So if you continuously find vertices with degree you know, less than k, remove them in this peeling sort of way, what you will be left with is, in fact, the k-core. Okay? You can, again, simple inductive type proof. Okay? Um, and you know, one of the ways that it comes out in the analysis is as you peel, um, you know, that, that makes it useful. The reason that these sorts of analyses work is that if you start with a random graph, generally what you can show is that inductively you still have a random graph as you peel. You know, so in every step in the way you can say, oh, I still have a random graph. It's just the degree distribution is going to change as you go, right? Because the degree distribution may depend on, you know, what things you've already now deleted. Okay. In particular, it affects how many edges are left for so on for example. All right, so the first two examples I gave may seem like pretty theoretical problems. And the point is, you know, these are not just for theory. Um, they're for, you know, more practical theory. Um, uh, sort of thing like uh, codes, error correcting, erasure correcting codes, and hash-based data structures. And one of the things I've been finding in my work is these ideas somehow just keep popping up over and over again. Uh, which is great for me because I get to keep writing the same paper, but finding a, a different application. Um, uh, but in terms of like this practice theory connection, is that the resulting algorithms and data structures are, tend to be really very efficient, very fast. And that makes sense, right? They're following greedy algorithm approach. One of the things we, we, I teach my undergrads in the algorithms class is that you know, greedy is the first thing you should try because when it works, it's amazingly fast and simple and works really well. Okay? And because of this, I think you know, the peeling paradigm, I suspect, we're going to find a lot more places where it's going to be useful for big data algorithms. Because if you're focusing on big data, you really need things to work fast. You really want to be thinking in terms of linear time algorithms. You may be willing to give up other things in order to get linear time. Um, and because these are simple, greedy algorithms, they tend to work in linear time. Okay. So let me give just another couple of quick examples. Uh, peeling algorithms came up a lot in from my work on low-density parity check codes. The way to think of low-density parity check codes is you have 
sort of the messages symbols that you want to send on the left, and you have some amount of redundancy that you're also going to send with it on the right, which is generally going to be the exclusive or of some of the original message symbols. Okay? And you can think of this, again, naturally as a graph, right, where you're connected to the things that are being XORed. Uh, worked on a bunch of low-density parity check codes where that graph in the middle was random, uh, according to some degree distribution. Right? And the basic algorithms that work are by peeling. Right? So this is decoding by peeling. So here, uh, if the colors are working for you, the blue dots are maybe things that have arrived successfully, and the, the reddish type things with the question marks are things that haven't. Right? And you can see right, this uh, first dot up at the top was the exclusive OR of A, B, and F. Um, but if you have A and F arrive, right, then you can you know, solve linear equations and unknowns, you can exclusive or those values back in, and you say, hey, look, what's left in that node there is the value B, which I happen to have been missing. Right? So I can recover the value of B, and I can, once I've recovered the value of B, I'm going to remove that node and the adjacent edges from the graph. What I mean by removing that node and the adjacent edges from the graph is I go ahead and exclusive or that value back into the neighbors, and try and keep going. Right? And you can see, again, I have the same process here, where I've now discovered or developed a new node uh, that just has a single value in, which lets me recover another value, and so on. So a lot of the low-density parity check code algorithms, the fast ones, are based on peeling. Um, right? So successful decoding here means emptying out the graph. Right? Um, or equivalently saying that the graph has an empty two core. Okay, and so you use the peeling analysis to determine when you get the empty two core with high probability. And again, you have this threshold effect that you, know, you can correct up to a certain number of missing symbols. Um, and there's a threshold for that using this sort of peeling analysis. Right, another recent place where peelings come up uh, is work on tabulation hashing, uh, which has been by uh, uh, Petrascu and Thorup. Um, so tabulation hashing, the idea is that you uh, actually start with a big table that's going to give you your hash values. Right? So the idea is uh, here I've taken, say, all 8-bit sequences, and I have this sort of character table of, which is marked with four characters. And inside the table, I filled with some random strings. Okay? Uh, in this case, the random strings are all 12, bit long, 12 bits long. And what this allows me to do is say, OK, I can develop a hash value for any 32-bit string into a 12-bit string using this table by just XORing these random values together. Okay? So if this, say, was my 32-bit string, right? which we can see breaks up into four characters, each of eight bits. Okay. So for the first character, I look up the corresponding entry in the character one column, the second eight bits in the character two column, and so on. And I get these four 12-bit values, and I just XOR them together, and that will be my hash value. Okay. All right, and now what does this have to do with peeling? So if I have a set of strings being hashed, I can peel as follows. Okay? So if I can find a string in that set where it's the only string that maps to a specific character value position, right? so if there's only one string that, say, lands in that you know, green spot right there that I've marked, okay? um, then that string's hash value is going to be independent of all the other strings in the set because it's been XORed with its own unique independent random value. Okay. So what I can do is now peel that string out of the set and continue. Okay. And maybe this opens up a new degree one cell in the table for some other string, which will itself I'll then be able to say has its own unique independent value and so on. Okay. So you can view the question of, does this set of strings, are they all getting independent values? You can view that in terms of this peeling process. Okay. And using that idea, Petrascu and Thora, Thora prove you know, some interesting things about 
these sorts of hashing, which I'm just not even going to get into because I have you know, more slides than I have time, and I really don't want to keep you here all day. OK, so that's sort of a survey of a bunch of old stuff. Let me now try and you know, present some, some more newish stuff. Okay. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about invertible bloom lookup tables, uh, which are sort of a, uh, I'm not sure if I want to call them extension or sort of a tighter analysis of some of the work on invertible bloom filters. Um, so really, all this is Michael Goodrich's work, who's going to be talking tomorrow. Um, OK. so. Let me tell you, before I get into the data structure, let me tell you about the problems that, that the data structure is designed to help solve. Okay. Um, so one is called the stragglers problem. Okay, so uh, we can think of it, you know, in, in networking, we'd think of it as flows going through a, a router. In uh, other applications, we might just think of it in security applications, we might think of it as people entering and leaving a building. Right, so people enter a building over time. At the end of the day, people leave a building. You'd like to make sure that everybody's left or possibly recover the people who are, who are, you know, who are left. Now, this is easy to do, right? You can just keep a very, very big list of all the people that have entered the building. But from a data structure point of view, this seems very wasteful. You're keeping a long list when at the end of the day, the information that you're going to want is this very small number of people who might still be left in the building. So if you have some bound, say, on that number, what you'd like is some sort of structure that's proportional to the size, not of the entire list of people who go in and out, right? But what you want is a data structure whose size is proportional to the, the number of people who are left at the end of the day, the people who you want to list at the end of the process. Okay. Does that application make sense? All right, uh, a similar, you can sort of maybe see the relationship, similar sort of application um, has to do with set reconciliation. And here we think of maybe a practical setting as being in the context of databases, distributed databases, where two parties have nearly the same database, but maybe they've gone out of sync for a small period of time, and they want to reconcile themselves, right? So a way to model this is we have two players, each with their own set of keys, which we assume have a very large overlap, and we want the parties to learn the set difference. What are the keys I have? You don't have, say, and vice versa. Okay. And again, the goal here should be not that we have to send all the data over. Right? Ideally, what we'd like is that the amount of communication is proportional to the size of the difference, not to the size of the actual structures themselves. Okay. All right. So. Invertible bloom lookup tables, which are sort of a variation themselves on bloom filters, um, give a way of doing this. Okay. All right, so IBLT data structures, you can say insert key value pairs, delete key value pairs. You can get the value for a key uh, with the possibility of some sort of error, the error being that you might say, you know, I'm not sure what the value is, I couldn't find the value in some instances. And you'd also like to be able to list entries. So it will list all the current key value pairs as long as the load is not too high. That is, you have to put in some sort of design threshold that says, I can list out these key values for you with high probability as long as the number of them is, say, not too high. OK. Um, in terms of the analysis, we can do this work. There are various ways, settings you could imagine the analysis. So a nice-ish system would have the property that each key would just have one value, and you only delete things that have actually been inserted. Right? You aren't going to delete things that aren't already in the system. Okay. And there are other versions that are less nice that might have multiple key value pairs or duplicates or other deletions and things. For now, let's focus at least on the thinking of it for the nice system. That's what I'll go over here. Okay. okay, so the nice system is really going to look like, uh, for those of you who have seen it, although I'm not going to describe it to here, sort of a bloom filter. Okay, so the idea is we take a table, we'll split it up into separate subtables, and we'll hash each pair j times. So we'll have j subtables, we'll have j hash functions. Each hash function will give a location in one of the subtables, and what will happen is that. Uh, in each of the loca locations, we're going to, on an insert, we'll say increase the count for that cell. Note that there's one more thing there. 
um, we'll keep a key sum and a value sum, okay, where you can think of sum as being actual sum or generally what we'll do is just use XORs, right? So the sum there is going to be an XOR sum. Okay. The nice thing about using an XOR sum is then the degree, decrease count is extremely symmetric. Deletes sort of do the opposite. All right, now you can see what happens if you're doing a, a get operation, you know, find me the value. You can say, well, if there's any cell that has a count of one, right, and the key matches, right, then you've found the right key and you can actually return the value. Okay. Um, and then it may be the case, though, that even though the key is in the system, other items have hashed to the same locations and so you can't tell what the key is and in that case, you may have to return not found. I couldn't find you the value of the key. Okay. And depending on how you parameterize the system, that'll determine the probability that you can successfully uh, return a value for the get. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details here, so I can get through some of the other stuff. Um, but you can use a Bloom filter type analysis uh, to get the probability that gets returned not found for keys in the system and for keys not in the system. Okay, so what about the, maybe the more interesting part, listing, okay? So how do you do listing? Well, it's just going to be the same peeling process, right? So while you can find something that has a count of one, pull it out of the system, pull out the key and the value, delete it from the IBLT, and keep going. Okay. So this would be like one sort of step you could see here, right? So over here on the left, uh, you know, I've managed to find a cell that has a count of one, right? So I find the key in the cell, look at all the places that that hashes to, right? And I say, aha, I can now delete this item. So I reduce all those counts and look, lo and behold, it's created a new cell that has just one thing in it, which gives me the next thing that I can recover. And again, the hope is that I can keep peeling all the way until I've removed everything from the table. All right, so that's sort of the verbal description of this listing process. You know, while you find things with a count of one, take out the key value pair, call delete, and keep going, right? And this is exactly the same peeling process that we've seen before uh, to find, you know, when you talked about for decoding, it corresponds to finding the two core of a random hypergraph. And complete recovery means that you end up with an empty two core. That is, you've peeled away the entire graph. Uh, so we can use results for these sort of thresholds to say uh, when we can recover or exactly what that means is like how much space we need to store n items, right? It depends on the number of hash functions, right? So, you know, m over n, the ratio of space we need, we need like if we want to be able to recover from n items inside, when we use three hash functions, we need about 1.2 n cells. Right, so the space factor that we need is a small constant additional factor. Okay. Um, it increases with the number of hash functions, but the probability of success increases with the number of hash functions. So there's sort of a trade-off there. Um, I usually think, at least for these data structures, as being regular, but if you wanted to push the 1.22 down to, you know, 1 plus epsilon-ish, uh, there are ways to do that by using what are called, you know, corresponding to irregular codes there are irregular IBLTs where different keys end up having a different number of hash functions. It turns out that that's a, a useful way to drive the, the space cost down. Okay. Um, so again, near the end of my time, across just a couple more minutes, I'm just going to give some of the applications and recent results for IBLTs um, and, and for peeling. Um, so one thing that we've done is, you know, it's sort of funny that I described low density parity check codes um, and the peeling process, and then I described IBLTs. Um, perhaps, maybe not so surprisingly, you can turn around and say, well, if you've got the IBLT as sort of your base data structure, you can turn around and build, just build a code naturally on top of that. Uh, and that was worth work with George Varghese. Um, you know, you don't need to think about graphs. You can just think about hashing. Um, this may not be you know, it doesn't give you, a, in a sense, any new coding results, but I personally think that if I was going to introduce coding, say, to undergraduate algorithms course, I would prefer to 
uh, prefer to introduce it by way of hashing than by way of, say, random graphs or other things. Um, so, you know, didactically, I think this is a pretty interesting way of uh, getting students to interested in coding. Um, right, so this just gives you a, a variant on these low uh, density parity check codes for correcting errors on what's called the QWERY channel, um, where the QWERY channel uh, means that your symbols are actually, you can think of those strings as bits, as you can think of working from, you know, mod Q. Uh, it's all done in terms of hashing and makes use of this sort of connection between set reconciliation and coding. Um, and so here I'm really just, I'm not going to get into how you build the BIF code. You know, you can look at the paper if you want to see that, but just sort of uh, state the result. Um, all right, some newer stuff uh, out on the archive, um, which I guess, you know, fits into the theme of, you know, I wanted at least a few slides to explain why I was invited here. Um, so uh, talk about parallel peeling. All right, so um, the idea of parallel peeling, right, is that, you know, think you've got this random graph or random hypergraph, and what I've been saying is that while there's a node that has degree less than k, it can remove itself from the graph and the adjacent edges and continue. And I've been describing that as a sequential process, right? But there's no reason you couldn't turn that into a parallel process, right? If you have a thread, say, for each vertex, right, the vertices can, you know, each individually look at themselves, say, hey, wait, you know, I've got too few edges, I'm going to remove myself from the graph, okay? And that can all happen in parallel at the same time for many nodes. So sort of the first high-level question you'd ask is, how many of these rounds of peeling are necessary if the nodes are doing this in parallel? Okay. Um, and it turns out that there's something really, you know, to me it was a bit surprising and interesting what happened, which is that if you're above the threshold, that is if you're collapsing to a, a non-trivial core, a non-empty, non-trivial core, then it actually took at least you know, omega log n rounds to... to complete. Um, on the other hand, if you're below the threshold, that is you're going to an empty core, then it actually only took or only order log log n rounds. Okay. And to me, what's fun or exciting as a, as a theorist about this result is that almost all the applications that I know and care about for peeling, the goal is to get an empty core, right? The sort of complete recovery in the IBLT or complete decoding or so on. The, the goal is to get an empty core. So I find it just sort of nice that, you know, nature made it the case that the setting that I want algorithmically is the faster case, you know, theoretically. Um, um, so because of this, peeling algorithms are fast and very amenable to parallelization. Um, I'll just sort of briefly spend a minute sketching the argument. You know, the, this typically follows... Uh, the uh, typical way of analyzing these sorts of things is to start with a random tree argument. Random hypergraphs, sparse random hypergraphs locally look like a tree. And if you just think of them as being a tree, just ignore the fact that, you know, things may collide. Um, you can develop a recursion for the fraction of peel nodes after j rounds based on what happened after j minus 1 rounds by carefully examining the tree. Um, and what ends up happening uh, for those who know about my work on, on load balancing and how, you know, where log log ends come in there from double exponential fall off on the tails, you get actually the same sort of thing out of these recursions. It's actually eerie how similar, uh, uh, in some sense, the recursions come out being. You get a double exponential fall off. The, the probability that you're still around falls off double exponentially with the number of rounds, which means you can get order log log n rounds to finish everything up. Um, you know, then once you have this ideal argument, you have to tune it up to deal with, you know, annoying probability issues, uh, you know, concentration and so on. Um, uh, we can even find the dependence uh, on, of the number of rounds uh, required on the gap from the threshold, right, as you might imagine. Sort of the, the closer you are to the threshold, the more rounds it ends up taking. Um, we even implemented this, um, where obviously by we, I mean mostly my student, Justin Thaler, or ex-student, Justin Thaler, who is here this year and is, is in the audience. Um, uh, you know, besides the theory, he actually 
got something of this going where each cell gets a thread. So we have actual numbers showing that it works. And it was actually interesting, something that came out of the implementation um, was we had to you know, sort of go back to the theory. Um, you know, a problem is, you can think uh, sort of a locking problem that occurs with the implementation is, what if two nodes um, uh, you know, want to delete the same edge at the same time, right? You know, so what if you, know, you have your threads looking at the vertices and they both say, aha, we're both going to delete this edge, and so they end up both deleting things at the same time. That would be bad as you try and continue your IBLT type deletion process. Um, and it turned out this interesting solution uh, was to use the subtables that we, we sort of naturally use in the IBLT. Uh, the ith subtable comes to sort of the ith vertex in your, in your hyper edge. Um, and the idea is that if you process the subtables themselves sequentially within your parallel rounds, you can guarantee that each element is deleted only once and avoid locking issues or problems. Um, and it turns out that this is both effective practically and leads to an interesting analysis. Um, just briefly for the normal analysis gives a double exponential fall off like the sort of standard balanced allocation paradigm. This process leads to a fall off like uh, Volking's variation of the balanced allocation paradigm. For those who know that, where ties break in one direction. Um, so there are, again, all sorts of funny, interesting connections going on here. Um, last sort of bit of new stuff is that um, something I've gotten interested in with a variety of algorithms is that instead of choosing k random values uh, when you do these sorts of, of uh, choosing k random uh, hash function type tricks, um, suppose instead you use double hashing. Okay, so the idea in double hashing is that you pick two values and just take the natural linear combinations of them. Right, this is how double hashing works for normal hash tables, and I'm sort of taking that idea or the same idea here when I'm saying I want to choose k hash values. Okay. Um, what we can show with, uh, in some cases in theory and in other cases just empirically, um, again, this was with, with Justin, uh, was that when using peeling, double hashing is as good as having k random hashes. Um, and there's some, definitely some compelling intuition for why that's the case. In some cases, we can turn that into intuition to full proofs. Um, uh, this is actually useful in practice. The way people actually implement getting multiple hash values in practice is often to use double hashing. Um, and so being able to say that that's perfectly fine and a good way to do it um, is, is nice for making the practitioners happy. Okay. So the goal here was just to introduce you to this idea of peeling, show you that it occurs in all sorts of different settings, yields really fast algorithms, very effective, um, amenable to parallelization. And so I think it's a technique that we're going to see uh, keep arising in a, a variety of uh, big data type algorithms uh, going forward. Thank Michael again.